Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome. I think we'll get started. Welcome to the Health Law Institute's seminar series. Um, I am so delighted to have my colleague here today. My name is Martha Painter. I am a registered nurse working clinically in abortion and reproductive health care. And I, with uh, Megan, we are both Trudeau scholars. And my work is based out of the School of Nursing, and I'm happy to be a research scholar at the Health Law Institute. I also chair Women's Wellness Within, and Megan has kindly agreed to also um, do a talk tomorrow for Women's Wellness Within, mm -hmm. our nonprofit here in Nova Scotia that works for reproductive justice and prison abolition. So the Health Law Seminar Series is a platform for sharing research and ideas on issues of health law and policy. The Health Law Institute itself is a group of university faculty, policy analysts, and student fellows committed to the advancement of health law and policy and the improvement of healthcare systems and practice. And you can visit our website for more information. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Megan and to thank her for joining us today. A global health nurse and policymaker, Megan is a Trudeau Scholar at the University of Oxford's Center for Evidence-Based Intervention, researching the impact of drug policy and child welfare systems on maternal mortality. For over a decade, Megan has provided technical assistance to international organizations such as the WHO, UNDP, UNAIDS, the World Bank, and the Global Fund to End AIDS, TB, and malaria, supporting access to healthcare, worker, healthcare for sex workers, uh, LGBTQ and people who use drugs in Central Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, West and Central Africa, the Middle East, and North Africa. In Canada, she has served as the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction in British Columbia, as Clinical Coordinator of North America's first supervised injections facility, Insight and as a street nurse and senior practice leader at the BC Center for Disease Control. Mm -hmm. Megan's academic interests include health systems, gender equity, and access to healthcare for marginalized populations. She is an adjunct professor at UBC School of Nursing and holds clinical scientist affiliations with the BC Center for Disease Control and the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity. She holds a Master's of Science in Public Health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and is a registered nurse with advanced practice certification in sexual and reproductive health, HIV, and addiction medicine. We are grateful, Megan, will also present tomorrow at Women's Wellness Within Annual Conference in Spryfield, Confronting the Carceral State, Autonomy, Community, and Liberation. Over to you. Um, that's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and I'm really honored to be here. And um, uh, and thank you. We're, I know we're on the traditional uh, unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people, and I come from Coast Salish territory. You can probably hear I don't have a British accent. So again, I'm from Vancouver traditionally and grew up there, but really honored to be here, and thank you for coming. It would be great to just know a little bit about the audience, So, um, if we're a room primarily of lawyers or social work or where people work. So how many of you are joining from the law faculty and practice, practicing lawyers? Amazing. And what about anybody here from nursing? Oh, exciting. And medicine or any physicians? Oh, hello. Social work? Okay. What about sort of outreach community workers? Awesome. Thanks for coming. And peers, I included that. Uh, awesome. Well, really diverse group. So that's exciting. And sorry if I speak a bit of epidemiological language sometimes. So please feel free to um, a, ask me to raise my voice, but also to define any, any terms that might be confusing because we're quite a, a mixed audience. I also want to declare that I don't have any conflicts, traditional and public health, to talk about whether or not we have like, mm -hmm. pharmaceutical conflicts or, or others. But um, this should also say my positionality. So I, this work that I do comes primarily from a critical theoretical framework informed by feminist and post-colonial uh, perspectives. And also um, might not recognize that woman because it's me 20 years ago, but this is me uh, with my son, my oldest son, Brayden. And so I was what would have uh, probably been labeled as a teen mother. I was a, a young woman that used drugs and come very much um, from this work from the position that if 
I had had a urine drug screen when I was pregnant, it probably would have been positive and I may very well have been one of the women that I'm talking to about today that would have lost custody of their child. And partly because of the privilege of uh, being a settler and having a sort of white skin, that didn't happen to me, but that's certainly not the experience of many of the women that I work with. And so I just wanted to sort of frame that before I speak and say thank you to my son Braden, who I often um, like to say saved my life and is one of the reasons he's now in, in Montreal and studying at university and um, we've had a wonderful adventures together and he, he's a really big part of why I do this work. So don't, don't cry at the beginning of your talk. <laughs> Lesson rule, everyone. <laughs> Epidemiology. Uh, I like to, I've also over the years learned um, that numbers can be really powerful in influencing policy. And so I like to think of epidemiology as a way to tell stories with numbers. And um, why are we talking about this today? Uh, substance use among women is really a, a big public health issue internationally. It's certainly a big issue in Canada. Um, and then so is the child welfare system. So Canada has one of the highest rates of children in care in the world, um, upwards of 3% of children in care, um, similar to our neighbors um, in the south in the US. And so we tend to have a more risk averse system in contrast to the European system, one where we apprehend quite a bit earlier than they do in European contexts. And we're really focused um, primarily on the infant, you know, as, as, as child welfare systems should be. So it's not to say that um, abuse is acceptable. We're not here to say that um, the child welfare system needs to be abolished. Certainly we need to protect vulnerable children, but just that perhaps there are some fundamental issues of the system um, needing to be redesigned. Primarily this is because women who are marginalized by poverty, race, substance use, mental illness are really experiencing disproportionate burden of monitoring. Um, some of my colleagues uh, that I work with like to say if there was a, t a camera in any of our homes, we would probably potentially have you know, certain fights with our children where we might um, be, people might judge us. And what happens to my clients, particularly Indigenous women that I work with, they're just right away referred. They're referred with birth alerts before their children are even born. And they're just monitored to such a high degree and it causes so much stress that um, they're not really given a chance to parent. This is really bears out in the statistics, um, and Dr. Blackstock, Cindy Blackstock, and a number of others have been um, talking about this for some time, and it's finally starting to get some attention, so I'm sure you're familiar that Indigenous families are really overrepresented in Canada. These are quite shocking numbers, so uh, if you consider that Indigenous people are between 4 to 7 percent of the population in most provinces, in terms of a national average, and then you see in my own province of British Columbia, representing 68 percent of the children in care and in some other provinces, up, upwards of 100. In Nova Scotia, it's 27%. I don't know what your 4% of the population, but 27% of kids in care. So you, you can see it's, it's quite a dramatic overrepresentation. And, and Indigenous scholars talk about this, the root of this being colonization, experiences of residential school, continuing till into the 60s scoop, and then now, um, more children being apprehended than were ever in residential school. And so it's, it's really this persistent racism in the system and this persistent, persistent inequities around poverty and marginalization. Uh, we also know that um, when children are apprehended, um, mothers describe this in the qualitative literature as like a living death. So the bereavement experience is quite intense. Uh, because they often know that they're, you know, the child is there, but they can't access them. So it's, it, some mothers have said, who've also lost children have described it as being worse than, than losing a child. Particularly for the mothers that I work with who themselves were raised in foster care, which is quite common, um, this intergenerational foster care. If they experienced abuse in foster care, which is also quite common, say sexual abuse, to then know that you're a child is completely removed from you and that you don't have access to them. I think anyone who's a parent, um, particularly when you felt like the removal was unfair and unjustified, that that's really distressing. And what I, what I think is confusing sometimes to, to colleagues working on the social work side or law is that those women don't necessarily make their court appointments or they don't come back and make all of the steps to get their children back. And what my, my work is trying to demonstrate is because they're experiencing a profound grief response and a trauma, they often sort of shut down to protect themselves. And so what might look like indifference to the system is actually just 
that's all they can do to cope. Um, and, and this has been described really well in the qualitative literature, but not so well in the kind of quantitative public health literature. Um, with the exception probably of a couple colleagues, Dr. Elizabeth Wall Weiler out of Winnipeg did a really great paper um, that some of you in the health law seminar series or, or health class are, are reading now. And that's, um, she looked at mortality among sisters who had similar birth cohort experiences and compared sisters who had a child apprehended and sisters who didn't and found that the women who had had a child apprehended were 3.4 or almost 3.5 times more likely to die after controlling for kind of confounders that you would expect like substance use, homelessness and poverty. So pretty dramatic and aside from Elizabeth's work, Dr. Dr. Kenny, Kathleen Kenny's done some work in, in Vancouver as well and then I'll talk to you about my research. Um, for anyone who works in this space, you're probably familiar with the amount of stigma and judgment that women who use drugs face, and this is primarily around illicit substances. We don't have the same stigma for or judgment for women who are using substances that are illicit or, or legal. And um, that's one of the greatest ironies in, in my you know, social networks as I, I'm the first person in my family to go to university, but now obviously have a lot of privilege being at Oxford and certainly meet families who, you know, middle class, upper middle class, white families who might use cocaine on the weekend and no one's taking their children away. No one's making posters about how they don't deserve to parent but women who are women of color might have a totally different experience with their substance use being seen as um, totally unacceptable and if there's one urine drug screen, they're arrested or their ch and their children are removed. And so there's just this really unjust way of framing substance use in different, cl that's very classist um, and that we see in our work. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with Lynn Paltrow from National <coughs> Advocates for Pregnant Women. So she's in the U.S. and in the U.S. context there, women who are pregnant can be arrested at, the, at, the, at, at pregnancy and forced into treatment. And she has this great slide. I won't read it out to you, but basically her, her thesis is, yeah, you know, practice not losing your job. Don't be poor. Don't have poor parents. Don't be illiterate. Um, try not to be a part of a racially or socially marginalized group. I mean, it's obviously a jokey, jokey slide, but her point is really, these are not modifiable factors for many of these women, and they really, um, they're judged based on their circumstance as opposed to actually their ability to parent. Um, our work is framed much more in an equity lens where we look at um, different context, people's access to you know, resources, education, income, the material circumstances of their life. In child welfare, I think one of the greatest tragedies is the, is the intersection between the homelessness crisis and child welfare. I don't know if you have this in Nova Scotia, but in Vancouver, where it's so expensive, one of the most expensive cities in the, in the country, um, we routinely see children removed because of uh, really poverty and the fact that the mother couldn't find a one-bedroom apartment. And often there's rules that if you have a child, you have to have a bedroom for them. And so women will, might be sort of in a social housing unit, for instance, with uh, uh, bachelors, and they'll lose that unit because they're pregnant, and when the baby delivers, the, they'll deliver, the child will be removed because they don't have a house to go back to, and then now they're no longer eligible for a one-bedroom apartment because <coughs> they don't have a child anymore because the child's in the care of the state. And it's, it's just mind-blowing, but this happens regularly Budgets are in different um, departments, uh, having worked in government, and I, I've personally tried to intervene to try and have money moved from the foster care budget, which is, you know, in a different different uh, ministry, to then this uh, ho housing budget, and it's like they don't they don't connect, and so there's there's just so much injustice in this in this sector um, that's hidden, and that we're, our our aim of our research is really to try and surface this in a in a way that. Um, is evident in sort of the epidemiological data. So I'm going to talk specifically about two papers today um, that are both in press, one in uh, the International Journal for Drug Policy and another um, in an upcoming edition, hopefully, of The Lancet, uh, and that's our mortality paper. But the, the third, the number three here of my thesis. So before I delve into the overdose crisis, I just want to, or the overdose paper, I just want to give a bit of background. If you're not familiar with this area, most of you are familiar, I'm sure, if you work in drug, in the drug policy space, but maybe not. 
Um, so the overdose crisis has now claimed more deaths than motor vehicle accidents and firearms in the U.S. It's actually um, impacted life expectancy in Canada for the first time in four decades. Um, so massive crisis. The research is primarily on cisgendered men. So there's sort of an assumption often, and, and this is true around the world, that you know overdose prevention sites or supervised consumption sites are often geared towards men, uh, needle and syringe programs, and women that use drugs are often have to be partly to protect their children more hidden and a bit and more underground in their drug use. They face sort of a double stigma often of being a mother and being a drug user. And we also know that um, there's just very little evidence about interventions that work specifically for women. So with this, we wanted to look at overdose within a cohort um, that I had the privilege to work with, which is run by Dr. Kate Shannon at the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity. So she has two cohorts. One is called Aisha of um, sex workers, and the other, Shauna, of women living with HIV. And they're met, they have the same questionnaire, so I merged the two data sets. And we also have access to, um, we do HIV and STI testing for the women and linkages to a population health data set using their PHN number. So we can look at coroner's data as well as hospital data and community health data. So within the context of this study, uh, it has a wonderful community advisory group of women with lived experience, primarily still in active sex work, women living with HIV, women who use drugs. And, and we were able to bring to them these research questions and have them sort of vet them. There's also a qualitative arm. And for this particular paper, we looked at um, we use bivariate and multivariable logistic regression using uh, GEE or generalized estimating equations to examine the association between child removal and overdose. And so not, not surprising in some respects, we um, found that of the, of the almost 700 women who'd reported ever having a live birth, almost 40% had had a child removed, so quite a high underlying rate of child removal. It was distressingly higher for the indigenous women, so almost double that. Um, which was not surprising but, but devastating for the women that were involved in the community advisory. We also found um, quite a high rate of overdose, so 35.1 reported ever having a, a non-fatal unintended overdose. So in, in uh, Canada generally we, we separate out suicide, intentional overdose with unintentional, so these are sort of what we'd probably in Vancouver context be fentanyl poisonings, accidental poisonings. And 19.4%, um, so almost 20%, had had an overdose in the past six months at any point in our follow-up. So also quite high, given that people generally perceive this as more of a male problem. And, and in our bivariate analysis, we found that uh, child removal was associated with over 80% higher odds of unintentional non-fatal overdose. And when we controlled for confounders, so I'll just go right to that slide, in our final multivariable model, um, we use stepwise regression to include you know, baseline substance use, uh, recent sex work, looked at homelessness, poverty, a number of different kind of confounders. And, and what was left in the model was education and um, having indigenous ethnicity. And ev after controlling for all those confounders, we found that women were 1.55 times more. So that's the adjusted odds ratio likely to have an overdose when you compared women with really similar life circumstances that hadn't had a child removed. So here we sort of see what I think we knew um, was happening clinically, what I saw as a, as a street nurse and at Shiwei, but I, now here's this story with the numbers. We also found, just going back a bit, um, women who'd been in jail uh, and um, had experiences with corrections had also a higher overdose rate. I think I have a slide on that. 81% um, versus women who had uh, all the women was 62%. And so we know experiences of jail, especially short-term frequent ones, really increase people's risk of overdose because they come into jail, have a period of abstinence, then they might leave, use the same amount that they had used previously, and because they, their tolerance is decreased, they're much more likely to overdose. So in BC, certainly we've been arguing that these kind of short-term uh, experiences when people have, say, even unpaid parking tickets people will get like these sh when they're poor and unable to pay they'll start to get these like oh well you'll spend a night in, in cells until we can get this organized that these are really dangerous and we're seeing people overdose much more likely after these periods of um, jail. jail. Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. So when you're um, your associations 
Are you looking cross-sectional or are you using time? This, this is, is time, time. Yes. yeah. So G is a time point analysis. So it's, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So, so it's a prospective longitudinal cohort. So we have eight years of data and the, up, up until just, you know, we refresh the cohort every six months. So they get um, questionnaires every six months. And so we are, a, are able to sort of pinpoint. So the child apprehensions primarily happened at baseline, and then the overdoses are post. And mortality, obviously, the mortality is clearly temporality is established. I'll show that paper next. Less, we don't have enough new apprehensions in the cohort, too. So there's 39 new ones over the last eight years. So we weren't able to say, like, here was a child apprehended and the overdose happened six months after that. But we do, these, base, these removals are all baseline, and these overdoses are all in follow-up, so there is some temporality. But great question, thank you. Um, if you're not in public health, it's, yeah, they're quite uh, much more robust than just a cross-sectional sort of one-time analyses. Um, going back to the indigenous um, issue, because of, the, of what we described, the over-representation of indigenous women, we, we did a joint effects model to look at um, the specific issue comparing indigenous women to non-indigenous women. So we used uh, non-indigenous women who hadn't had a child removed as the reference population. And just making sure you see what I see. And uh, found that indigenous women who did experience child removal, if you look at the far right, the 2.09, were more than double um, likely to have experienced um, an unintended non-fatal overdose than, than the reference population. So again, even sort of more dramatic and distressing findings, and this was adjusted for education, food insecurity, and sex work. Uh, I talked about that already. Um, in terms of criminalization, just given the legal scholars in the room, forgive me if this might not be totally up to date because I am not a lawyer, but what I understand from colleagues in the field is that um, in Canada, the question of whether a woman legally owes a duty of care to her fetus went before the Supreme Court, um, a case Miss G, I think a 24-year-old in Winnipeg, and the court concluded that they, we do not have the right to force pregnant women into treatment programs. And this is, I think, often misunderstood by clinicians and um, I would say social workers and others in the field who really, when they have a woman that they feel is using and they really, they really want to like just take her and put her somewhere and like get her, f force her into treatment. And, and I think the court upheld this finding that many of us have found, which is that the literature just doesn't support that. There are so many forced treatment programs in the U.S. that have fairly robust um, evaluations, and the people don't stay abstinent. So they might have a period of abstinence when they're forced in. Um, one of the favorite things people and family members always come to me to is, can't we kidnap our child? Can't we do secure care? having sat and, and reviewed that evidence with the Minister for Secured Care in British Columbia versus Alberta, we, we just know it doesn't, it doesn't work. And the, the people who experience that, experience that as a trauma. They lose trust with their family members, they lose trust in the system, and they just go out and use on relapse. That's not true of everyone. Certainly have colleagues in recovery who experienced, um, had a good experience that's anecdotal, but the, the literature just doesn't support that forced treatment works. Um, we also know that um, preg pregnant women who use substances and mothers generally are already hiding. <laughs> they're, f they're scared about losing their children and that sort of these forced coercive practices drive them further underground. We know that from the U.S. context and that these forced treatment laws um, are always un un uh, applied unfairly to women who are poor or racialized for many of the reasons we talked about earlier. And that and then finally, if fetuses were to be granted a legal right to care, the court found that that power could be extended to control many of women of childbearing age um, practices and that it just sort of wasn't, wasn't worth it to have this. And so we know it, it just, it's, it's not worth it. Um, so that's kind of a little side note on what I know about the law currently in Canada. <laughs> Maybe during the questions, some of the lawyers can help clarify that. Um, Move, switching gears now to the second paper on maternal mortality. So this was this is the beginning of this model. So we haven't quite finished the second phase of the second paper, second paper on the intersection with child child removal, but really just looking at mortality in the cohort. It, we use the same um, two cohorts, Sean and Aisha, that I described, um, adding in now coroner and hospital data, and we did a Cox proportional hazards model. We used the 2014 Canadian female population as our reference, 
but we also did a sensitivity analysis because when we started this paper, the overdose crisis hadn't, or this thesis, the overdose crisis hadn't really hit, uh, and we wanted to make sure, you know, was that explaining all the mortality? So we did a, a sensitivity analysis for 2017 as well. And then we look for predictors of mortality using time-dependent Cox proportional hazard regression. And then the second paper, which is just in process now, we'll look at removal versus non-removal, but I won't be presenting that today. So among the 700 women um, who were between 32 and 45, and these are the mothers in the cohort, 39 had uh, died in the eight years of follow-up which is almost 10 times um, more likely to die than women of the same age in the Canadian cohort. So it's quite a dramatic um, uh, standardized or mortality ratio, which is distressing um, for us and also not surprising in that it's women who use drugs, sex work, and women living with HIV. But keeping in mind that HIV is a treatable condition um, among men of sex with men in the general Canadian population and that they are actually having the same life expectancy as the Canadian general population. So at first when we found, um, we found one of the main predictors of death is HIV, we, t we were going to take HIV out of the model because we were like, oh, well, that's obvious. But actually it was my British colleagues at Oxford who were like, well, no, that shouldn't be obvious because HIV is a treatable condition. So if you have good access to treatment and it's free, which it is in British Columbia, why do they have such high mortality rates? So we ended up keeping, keeping it into the model. Um, what were the causes of death? Uh, about half of them were injury. And um, those were 18 deaths and 17 of the 18 were overdose deaths. Um, which was also really distressing. And uh, second was um, non-communicable diseases, which were primarily cancers. And then f the, the last, there was two deaths by communicable disease. So actually not as many were uh, HIV-related as you would think. It's just that the, I think the HIV in some ways is a, is a surrogate marker for, for poverty and mar marginalization, because women who acquire HIV often it's through the injection route in the British Columbia epidemic, so they're sort of surrogates for all the inequities we're talking about. Um, the predictors of mortality when we ran the uh, uh, Cox proportional hazard regression was HIV. So HIV was explaining, um, so 2.54 times more likely to die if they were HIV positive at baseline. And then um, having experience of child custody loss also held, it was sort of marginally significant. So you can see it they were 1.6 times more likely, but then the confidence intervals do cross one, but that's also not unexpected with such a small number of deaths. So uh, that stayed in the model. And then finally, intimate partner violence as well. So um, all modifiable factors. And then the next analyses will look at comparing mortality for women who'd experienced child removal or not. But that one's just in process with the statistician now. Um, so the strengths of this, again, are the perspective design. Thanks for that question, where we found um, we were able to look at uh, eight years of follow-up using GEE. Um, we also had biomarkers and population health data. And then we also used time location sampling. So that's a, a method so that we're not just taking a convenient sample of women that come into our drop-in center or our clinics. We're actually going out into the street and doing outreach. And that's, that outreach is sort of randomized, if you will. So we're actually reaching women that are not, not in care and not engaged with us, as well as women who are. And then uh, some of the limitations are um, underreporting or respondent-driven bias. So we're asking people really difficult questions about child welfare for all the reasons we discussed. There's a lot of shame related to that. So we try and minimize that by our interviewers are women from the community who are trained. They themselves are often former sex workers or active sex workers. They might be women living with HIV. And then there's a nurse questionnaire. So I've had the privilege to be a nurse on the study and was able to do the nursing component. And we ask the child questions at the end of the interview after we've established rapport. And we also follow up. So sometimes women denied having had any children in the first interview, but at baseline, after they get to know us, you know, we follow many of them for almost 10 years, they might disclose their child at sort of the second or third interview, and those are recoded back mm -hmm. into this analysis, so they're captured here. And we talked about temporality already between the exposure and the outcome. Um, not, not perfect, but we think we have sort of a clear pathway that we're describing. And then finally, um, there are confounders that we're, you know, if they're unknown to us, we're not able to measure. 
so after controlling for the <laughs> confounders that we do know, uh, what, what did we find? What's our conclusion? Um, we found that women who've had a child removed experience higher odds of non-fatal overdose and that these odds are highest among indigenous women. We also found that women in the cohort were almost 10 times more likely to die than women of the same age in the Canadian population and that the, re the reason, mo reasons most likely for death are HIV, ch experiences of child removal, and intimate partner violence. Um, we know women who use substances do that often as a method of coping with trauma, and that we have a really high prevalence of lifetime and recent overdose in the cohort, which tells us that we need, really need to start thinking about women's needs in terms of overdose prevention and having specific overdose prevention responses for women. Uh, we also f would recommend that when children are removed from the care as m of their, of their uh, mothers, as much as we hope that doesn't happen, that when it does, that enhanced support plans are in place. Most of the focus is really often on the infant and people, the women often kind of go up um, underground. So clinically we found they don't come back to see us again, partly because they're embarrassed or just very grief stricken. And that's actually how we think, the pa how that pathway happens, that these women are then no longer enrolled in HIV care because they might have been getting antiretrovirals from us. They're maybe no longer enrolled in opioid agonist therapy like methadone or buprenorphine with us because they've lost to care. So we really need to set up plans for these women when we know removal is going to happen and we need to aggressively outreach and support them and reassure them that we're going to help them navigate the court system. Um, and that we, we think that we need training for healthcare workers, and sorry, that should say probably social workers and lawyers and everybody um, to recognize and refer women who are, might be experiencing grief post child custody loss and for women that are at risk for overdose. So that's kind of the conclusions from our study. And I just want to wind up, I'll take some questions, but on a few more sort of more lessons from practice. Um, this photo is from the Portland Hotel Society's pro pro projects with families as well as Shiwei. This is one of our clients. And just um, our, our, our sort of take home message is that a urine drug screen is not an indicator of parenting ability. This happens so often in uh, clinical practice that um, someone will order a urine drug screen. Often it's women of color that get urine drug screens and then it's, they find something, it can, it, in the, before it was legalized, it was often cannabis, and that can just turn on this really massive response from child welfare that maybe as a clinician you weren't considering the impact of. Uh, it, is everyone familiar with the mother risk scandal? A few of you, yeah. So this, is a, this was the lab that most of us sent our urine drug screens to in Toronto, and um, there was 1,400, there was a, a massive audit of it, and just essentially junk science. They found that the people who were running the lab were not trained in pathology, they had really poor practice, a lot of false positives. 1,400 families were separated with inaccurate false positives. That just shows you like the extent of how broken our, I think our courts and child welfare systems are, that these women actually hadn't even used drugs and they still lost their children. And it was just devastating. And this, this pattern I described to you of, of women just giving up hope, it, it, it can happen to anyone. And so this, this just happened, I think, two or three years ago. Some of you are reading a paper that um, Dr. Susan Boyd wrote, um, sort of exposing a scandal. And there, there was a report you can find online. But it's, it's very, very devastating. Uh, this, the headline is about a 10-year-old girl who's just now being returned to her mother that's been in foster care for you know, 10 years. Um, what are some other solutions to this? This is a, a program that I worked at called SheWay, which is a pregnancy and parenting program in British Columbia. There's a number of sister programs now, like um, Maxine Wright and others in the province. And there we have sort of one-stop shop models, which are in the literature a lot, where we can meet women where they're at. One of our uh, most effective programs is probably our hot lunch program. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with the crack baby literature from the 1980s where we thought women who'd, uh, who's ba or babies who'd been exposed to crack cocaine, you know, there was a lot of literature about how horrible their life trajectories would be. That's recently been debunked by a number of scientists who re-ran the analyses finding they were never controlled for mal the effects of malnutrition or poverty. And when you control for malnutrition and poverty, you actually find that the so-called effects of crack cocaine use in pregnancy almost dis is essentially disappear. 
it's not an advertisement for taking crack when you're pregnant, but it's just to say we really, there was a racialized lens applied where essentially it was mostly women of color in the U.S. who were getting these drug screens and losing custody of their children en masse as a sort of war on drugs approach um, and policing women's bodies. And we now know those women um, really, if they'd been offered hot meals and support instead of losing custody, might have been able to successfully parent. And so our hot, we have birth weights of the babies of women who are extremely marginalized um, and many of them homeless, but the birth weights and the baby's health are almost the same as population controls because they're getting fed, they're getting good nutrition, and, and as they're engaged with us, ultimately getting into housing. And so that housing first approaches really work and help stabilize families. Um, Cindy Black Blackstock and other scholars have also written about the importance of reconciliation and rebuilding the child welfare systems. So this is a paper that they wrote um, looking at these four components. So um, relating having sort of respectful co-design of child welfare reform. The second component is truth telling. So telling the story of how child welfare has really affected indigenous families. The third is acknowledging and um, learning from the past. And then finally, the fourth is the recommendation they have is to restore uh, and having redressed the harms that we've caused by this racial in, these racial injustices. And there's, there's a big movement in Canada now, I think, to reform the child welfare system, but we're all still living through that kind of tension as it, it hasn't quite been reformed yet. Um, and just a, a plug for Culture Saves Lives. This is a, an amazing program in Vancouver um, that Patrick and other colleagues founded at the Portland. About, and we, they've really found that having indigenous culture and for families to be able to participate in powwows and, and things that were previously literally outlawed under the Indian Act is, is so fundamental to women being able to reconnect um, to their culture and their family. And this is my final slide. So I, I hope that today you've got the takeaway that um, really to make a difference for women and children and families that we need to focus on income support, housing, food security, and safety rather than whether or not they took a drug or not. That's not about the drugs. Um, if for those of you who are clinicians in the room, we also know that opioid agonist therapy really helps. So replacing the what might be a dangerous, toxic, um, it could be poisoned street supply of drugs with something that's not poisoned. So that could be methadone or buprenorphine if the women wants. Could also be we use SROMs, low release oral morphine to great effect. Um, we're doing some pilots with fentanyl patches in BC as well, where we know that fentanyl is actually what people are, are um, needing to be replaced. And that's really where the real overdose risk comes from. It's when people are having to turn to the street for a toxic supply. Um, if you do have to involve child welfare agencies, um, we have had some success in doing early referrals in partnership with the mother. So uh, at Shiwe, for instance, we have a, a social worker that works on our team that's not a, uh, doesn't have apprehension powers, and she works with the mothers to introduce them to their social worker and to build safety plans and to um, sort of get child welfare involved. This can help mitigate birth alerts happening at the last minute. In BC, we've recently um, stopped using birth alerts. I understand. Does everyone know what birth alerts are? So birth alerts are when um, women are, f get flagged. So it could be a nurse or a doctor or someone they work with that flags their electronic medical record or the medical record in the hospital. And then what happens is um, those are then interpreted. There's very little information in them. And without a lot of context in the middle of the night when a, when a baby's delivered and women can experience a removal minutes after birth when they're you know, maybe breastfeeding, a birth alert's been flagged, child welfare will be called, and then the child will be apprehended directly after the, the um, delivery. It's very well documented in Blackstock's work and um, Minister Philpott, when she was Minister of Indigenous Services, came out and talked about the need to nationally sort of reform birth alerts. It's still a very common practice. My understanding is it happens here a lot. It certainly happens a lot in, in my province as well. And uh, for all the reasons we talked about, it's a really dangerous practice and not, not something um, that we're doing anymore in British Columbia. So Mr. Conroy recently um, placed a ban on it, so we don't do it anymore. Actually, here, I have this question. Child 
they can they can put on a child welfare can put on a birth alert. And do they put it on the hospital file? Yeah. So, so you can have a birth alert on your file because you were in the foster system as a child. Right. Yeah. That yeah, that used to happen to us. For any number of reasons. Yeah. 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 Your partner. Yeah, domestic yeah. violence. Previous involvement. Previous involvement. Yeah. For, often happens with previous involvement or a previous child or if you yourself were in the foster care system in our context. You sneezed, yes, that's another. It also doesn't dictate immediate apprehension, Yes. There's a very large trend sort of in Western nations for this birth alert and infant removals we see it in the UK as well, this sort of infant. And I think what we're asking with, with some of this research and other, and what, what women who've been through the system are asking for is to really, for clinicians to balance the risk benefit ratio of that. And there are workarounds. I mean, I don't know your system as well, but in British Columbia, the workarounds we found were trying to actually create that um, relationship earlier, even though we were initially really afraid to work with child welfare, even though, of course, they have the child's best interests at heart. We found that having the w women self-refer and start to build a relationship at pregnancy was useful, even though there's this legal gray area because the fetus isn't a person, but um, building, especially if we knew they already had an alert in the file um, and they, are, they themselves were in foster care or they'd had previous children removed, it, they're flagged already. And so we, we found that was a good uh, workaround. And the other was um, helping women to ask for help themselves. And so even as a clinician without, um, if you're working in rural practice or a lawyer working with someone that's not you know, in a place where there is wraparound service, uh, we found working with women to ask for help early was better than having a phone call. Because it's very hard to control the response. Like if you call from the hospital on a Saturday and you've got emergency services, sometimes it's police who respond to the alert. Like it's, it's really hard to control. And so um, asking for help with a woman, asking herself, we found sometimes can work. But, but also just knowing um, that it's, it's difficult to turn off once you've been intaked and that sometimes the response is a lot more dramatic than you would think. And having been through so many cases of, of babies that were removed that just really seemed profoundly unfair, even with us you know, making phone calls to ministers and using all of our advocacy powers, um, it, it can be really shocking. It can work beautifully. And of course, children shouldn't be abused and there needs to be you know, pathways when children are being abused. So it's, it's such a di difficult, um, difficult issue, but I hope, you've, hope we've been able to tell a bit of the story of the numbers of the impact on women's lives and that the, this system really does need reformed. And even if a child is, is removed, surely we don't think that that woman deserves to die after the removal. And so no matter how you feel about these issues, there's, there's got to be a better way of supporting families than removing them because they're poor or because they had the misfortune to be um, homeless. And so that's, that's, I'll close with that and just acknowledge especially the um, Community Advisory Committee who um, have very generously shared their stories and, and worked with us on this analysis and in particular my mentor from the Trudeau Foundation, Sophie Pierre, who was the former chief of St. Mary's Indian Band and she really contributed a lot to the paper and she's um, she parents some many children from her community that she helped save and she's lost many sisters and brothers to the sort of impact of the child welfare system so she was really crucial in informing this work so thank you to Sophie as well and if you have any questions um, these are my contacts but I'd love to open it up we, yeah we have yeah. plenty of time for questions thank you. Thank you.
understand the question about what's the happening for the most um, and just acceptance so that there's a lot of power we need to merge back into the power and make for them who have been experiencing trauma and second things and and be critical to the long term success of those families. Um, but I just think Yeah, yeah. It was it was one of my. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, there, there's a companion um, hospital program called First Square that Mar Martha was able to visit. So the comment if you couldn't hear was about about Shiwei and the community-based model, but it also works really well, which I didn't get a chance to speak about with First Square, which has a uh, a unit dedicated to moms who use substances, and it's sort of a safe zone from apprehension, and if you will, and it's it is a semi-locked unit, so. It kind of allows everyone to take a breath and allow the mothers to be together and the social workers, because again, they're doing their best and they're working to prevent this headline of like, I let that baby go home and something happened to the baby. So, I mean, we all, I have such empathy for the difficult spot they're in as well. And in, because we have First Square, which is a protected unit, we can sort of say they're here, you know, it's a safe place to be. Um, and it helps the system kind of calm down while they assess um, rather than just going right to this bedside removal, but we still still do see these re these removals. And one of the reasons the birth alerts happened was was an indigenous family that you might have seen in the news who actually documented, you know, on video and posted. I think it was on Facebook the child being baby removed. Age. Sorry, baby age. Yeah, the baby's age was yeah. The baby was like hours old. I H, think baby H, H baby age. Baby and that was what that family, but that. Often these children aren't, these cases aren't documented as much as you would think because once the children are removed, they're in the care of child welfare and you can't speak to the media as even as a parent. And so, um, you know, this family just kind of went ahead and did it with the advent of social media and that, that baby H kind of really changed the practice of birth alerts just six, six months, three months ago in British Columbia. Yeah. So I'm curious about satellite programs that don't exist and in a major mm -hmm. urban area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question about satellite programs. So we, we've just built a colleague, Denise Bradshaw, at BC Women's Hospital would be happy to share her resources. So she's building a, a clinical pathway, or has built, I should say, for women across the province. So for Square is a provincial resource out of our Provincial Health Services Authority. And Sheway is a Vancouver Coastal Health sort of partnership. So we have many satellite Sheways. There's one on Vancouver Island and one in Surrey, which is called Maxine Wright. They're not fi affiliated, but we're sort of sister programs, if you will. And they all sort of use FUR as a central resource, so women can come in from across the province and deliver there, um, which is problematic. It would be nice if they could deliver closer to home. So Denise is helping to build this pathway where the practices from First Square are sort of translated. Um, to, the, to other hospitals and so that we can have this sort of better understanding and training. So there is a perinatal addictions coordinator whose job it is to do skills building in, in the rest of the province. And then Dr. Abrahams and, and his colleagues have been doing a lot of kind of training and skills building around the world, really. Ron's often in Central Asia and Eastern Europe and him and I have worked together there um, on lots of different UNICEF projects and, and UNAIDS projects globally. So there's a, there's a number of resources that I'm happy to share. I think we, I've already shared with Martha around um, just yeah, clinical practice guidelines. We wrote an opioid um, agonist therapy treatment guideline for pregnancy that BCCSU wrote. And I was one of the authors, BC Center for Substance Use, in collaboration with Shiway. That's available online now. It's got a section on child welfare with some evidence. It's got Elizabeth's paper. I cited it in it just to sort of say, this is how we manage it here. So hopefully that's a tool for others. Um, so I, I would say in some ways, it's almost a hub and spoke model that we're starting to build out where there's this hub of, uh, of Fur Square and the, and the perinatal addictions unit. And then there's spokes in different communities. For very, very rural women, um, it really depends. Uh, what we found works best is sometimes coming out and doing skills building with the team and like getting a plan in place beforehand and helping reassure them that actually they can manage this at home. Um, Addiction is primarily a, now you know, chronic, viewed as a chronic disease. Opioid agonist therapy you can do as a, as a family physician, so helping to do skills building on methadone and buprenorphine. Um, and buprenorphine is now emerging as the safest 
um, medication in pregnancy, uh, prefer, preferred in most systematic reviews above methadone now. So that's again an oral medication that you can take if she's, an op if she's using opioids. Uh, so really d kind of reassuring people in community that they can manage this and can keep the mother closer to home if there's a plan in place. And if not, I'd say our practice is generally to bring them to Vancouver, which has its own risks. <coughs> it's not ideal to take people out of their <coughs> support networks and bring them to a place in the middle of a fentanyl overdose crisis with lots of drugs in the downtown east side. Sean? Hey, uh, Sean, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to wrap my, around, wrap my mind around something you said, because I'm not sure if I understood it. Um, the, the, having been in the foster system is viewed as mm -hmm. uh, so potentially damaging that you would get an alert on your mm -hmm. file mm -hmm. such that a child would then be funneled into the foster system. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what is the rationale for that? That's a really good question. I don't know if, for maybe for the Nova Scotia context, if you want to ans answer, I can speak from the BC system, but. I think a lot of times it's the, I know when I work with the First Nations communities here in Nova Scotia, a lot of us, because when the residential schools happen, a lot of those children, the children of the residential schools didn't really grow up with parenting skills or the ability to parent. Um, and then all of a sudden they are out in the system and the belief is that they can't parent or they lack parenting skills. So they would subsequently get um, flagged, not necessarily apprehended. Um, but I also know from working in child protection that when we would get the main, you could type it into the computer um, and you would see generation after generation was involved in the system, which always takes the question from my part is, what are we doing? Because we're obviously not helping if we're continuing to treat families. Um, so I, I, it can be a number of reasons. It could be um, because that maybe somebody in that family has a sexual perpetrator designation and that they're still involved in the family. Um, I know for, again, a lot of visible minorities, it's because of the fact that there's the belief that they weren't able to count through. Um, mm -hmm. you know, ripple effects from the residential mm -hmm. school system. I think too one of the one of the things that people there if you're not in the system you think you're referring to this like amazing family that's going to take this child mm -hmm. and that's not mm -hmm. the reality like in BC I can't I can't speak to the Nova Scotia context but especially youth are placed in hotels and we've had I mean Alex just this young beautiful young man who you know completed suicide jumped off a balcony bridge I mean he was someone was being paid $4,000 a month to check in on him and hadn't checked in on him in months and weren't answering his texts in distress. And he was living in a hotel, he was 15, with 10 other foster children in like a horrific situation in a, a suburb of Vancouver. And like, this is what you're referring to. Like you're not referring to a grandmother's breaking cookies. So you're taking people out of this, their family of origin because the mother's homeless and you'll pay Four thousand dollars for like this private for-profit company to check in on them in hotels instead of just giving that money to house the family and keep them together. The number one reason for child removals in Canada is neglect, and then the subcategory of it is poverty. And so it's not it's not actually physical and sexual abuse and the drama that we think it is. And and clearly sexual and phys you know those are not acceptable. And you know th I've certainly also seen neglect with women who have untreated substance use disorder that again they need support but it doesn't mean they're not capable of treating their substance use and regaining family. And a lot of the children too, like, in fact when I worked at Child Protection in 20 some odd years ago, the majority of children that weren't apprehended at birth, um, so the children that were late adolescents, uh, early teens, probably averaged about I think at that point it was eight or nine homes um, that they would be put in mm -hmm. um, over the span of them being involved. So you get a, a youth that's involved at 14 by the time they age out of the system at 16, they might be in eight separate homes. So the, the yeah. system's not addressing the poverty or the neglect. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think to be, w when I said earlier that we know a lot about um, the impact of foster care on children and adolescents is there is quite a bit of literature on children who've grown up in the foster care system are more likely to be homeless, have mental health issues, substance use disorder. So again, you can sort of see from the child welfare standpoint, though that child becomes pregnant, you know they've been through this distressing period. That's the, one of the reasons for the flags because you know that they themselves have, they're living in a hotel. Um, I think, Dan, you had a point, and then, and then you start. It's just a question. So with the opioid overdose crisis, there's been this opening up of policy innovation around protocols. Right? I'm curious how much of this, which is so affected by that centrally, has been uploaded at the federal level. Like, if there's any kind of drug policy reform that's happening in Canada that addresses this. I I haven't seen anything. I'm really curious, like why it, why it hasn't, if it hasn't. Yeah. I think it's a it's a great point. I mean, I'm hoping this is kind of actually one of the first times I've, I've presented this. So it's or this is probably the outside from in my department and the publications and press. So we haven't we haven't done a lot other than Elizabeth's paper, which did did make some headlines. So two years I think two years ago, Elizabeth's paper on mortality in Winnipeg. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot of people doing, you know, as part of my, like, I did a systematic review and only found seven papers on the outcomes of child custody loss for women. Um, so it's definitely a, a sort of under-researched area. It's one of those that, especially if people are parents, are like, oh yeah, I can understand the grief of having my child removed, but it's just not, it's not documented, so it hasn't been, there hasn't been policy responses to this thing that's just out there that people think is obvious. Um, but at the same time, people have such profound stigma towards mothers who use drugs. And until you've worked at places like Shiwei and you know seen, seen these women's lives, it's really hard to explain. And even among drug users, there's often a lot of self-stigma within those groups that I myself have been you know part of. And so people, it's a very difficult thing to wrap your mind around. And even on my you know different thesis examination committees and things, people have been like, "But surely you're not." I've heard the comment, "Surely you're not suggesting that." women that use drugs can have their children you know and it's like oh that's a nice glass of wine in your hand like and I happen to know that you're someone that goes to Burning Man and uses recreational drugs but like you you're not saying that that's you know okay for for other women it's those women and so it's just a very um, and the, the overdose I don't think anyone's written about the overdose link that I know of the, the irony there is that stigma is one of the central planks of the new drug policy yeah. right? Destigmatizing substance use. So yeah. this seems like the most yeah. intense form of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Hopefully, get it out there. I think you had a question, and then go to you. Yeah. This week, I was really happy to hear that in Ontario, the conflict the child welfare system received five five million dollars from the private money, so that they could change the orientation from apprehension to keeping children in the home. Mm -hmm. With uh, and the parents and the government is supportive of this. The sad part, of course, is that they need private money to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so obviously, it's hard for governments to fund these things. And I'm sure that's the reason that a lot of them are much more reactive and crisis oriented mm -hmm. than proactive. So I'm just wondering, moving forward, and for you as a researcher, I think it's mm -hmm. great you've done this. Um, how do we build an evidence base mm -hmm. to look at whether these changes actually work and how important is that as opposed to stories and anecdotes about um, we must do this because it makes sense mm -hmm. and we must do this. Mm -hmm. so you yeah, I think I think it's crucial to have both. I mean, having been in government and you know worked, I know the Treasury Board folks well, and having tried to you know make a case, you they actually really do need data. So I think as much as um, I'm more of naturally a storyteller and someone that wants to just go out and do be an implementer as a nurse clinician, I've come to see having been on the inside of the government that you also need data, you need both, but you also, data doesn't change hearts and minds either. So I think you need um, strong advocates from women who've been through the system and um, and children, because children are often some of the strongest advocates about the distress they have and the, their own experiences in foster care. I think so. So I think you need both. One of one of the gaps in research, I would say, is quantifying the cost the cost of the current system. I'm not a health economist, but if anybody is, uh, or 
economists generally, I mean, the idea that it would be expensive to make a change, I would sort of refute that because I think actually the current system is extremely expensive. Uh, most of these infants get coded as having neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is an extremely problematic area of clinical practice without a solid evidence base. And the babies then are go to like extra expensive foster carers run often by nurses or people who are clinicians. And so they're thousands of dollars a month. And actually what we've found, and that's what Dr. Abrahams has written about, and there's a great paper in the Canadian Journal of Family Practice about, is if you keep the children together in what's called rooming in, and you let the mother breastfeed, especially if she has methadone, which is a safe, clean substitute for her opioids, the baby gets a bit of methadone in the breast milk, and they don't cry, and they're not um, anxious, and they're not, they don't have what we would call NAS, neonatal abstinence syndrome. So there's just stigma just throughout the whole pathway for these families. Because what they do now in most hospitals is they take the baby, they say, this baby has NAS, it has to go into a, it's so crazy, a room by itself in a, in a cubicle because it can't have stimulation and the lights have to be down. This happens all over the world. And then, oh, the baby cries and the baby's sweating because babies want to be held. But someone wrote about this practice like 30 years ago and it's really hard if you know about how to change hospital practice, it's really hard. So they just take the, and then they go, look at this poor baby's been exposed to drugs. Oh, it needs a foster home that, with a nurse that can treat its abstinence syndrome. And like, it's just this crazy making Whereas if they just let the baby cuddle with his mother or hold anybody, which we know works for everything else. Yeah, oh, it, so at first square, <laughs> it's been the first square. So we do, we don't use the Finnegan score, which is this problematic score that reinforces stigma. We use Eat, Sleep, Console, where we just, if a baby's crying, you pick it up, you feed it, you let it sleep, you let it you know, be with the mother. And so there's, I, I don't know what you do here in your hospital. We continue to have a titrated morphine. You do titrated morphine, morphine, yeah. We do use rooming in, though. Because That's great. That model, so they have with their parents. Yeah. We are currently using Finnegan. We've actually been working really close with DC to try and get an evidence base to work with our medicine colleagues yeah. to shift. So I think we're like... Close. Really, really That's great. And if you're using rooming in, which I which I thought you were, for years. which many many Canadian hospitals are using rooming in now, I would say it's more typical that we see this um, response in the U.S. context and internationally, it's still yeah, very much quite used. Quite yeah. 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 So yeah. You guys are some of the. I think j most major Canadian hospital centers now use rooming in. So it's, it's sort of a bit of a comment on international models. But it took quite a long time to build up that evidence. I mean, Ron couldn't publish that paper for years. People would just reject it and go, oh, it's biased. And like the stigma of you know pediatrics and, and others to, to read this, it was really difficult to explain why this there was no solid evidence base for this putting a baby in a dark room. There's still a really fetishized response to those kind of articles that come out saying like, oh, music therapy uh, yeah. helps the NAS baby, or um, volunteer cuddlers help yeah. the NAS baby, as opposed to the most the, uh, the actual intuitive response of being with your mom and breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. These, yeah. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Rooming in, sorry. Rooming can really only work if the mom is allowed near the baby. Yeah. Right. And that's not really the hospital's legal ability to provide. Right. So there's this other component. You can have rooming in, but if parents are not allowed near their children, then that is a bit major barrier to rooming in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry that we had a question there. Yeah, two questions. One sure. that you touched on. Like, you know, has anybody actually done a not microeconomics? Not yeah. But very generic economics for how much this costs, so we can see how we could better spend that money um, that society's already spending. Number mm -hmm. one, and, and going across the whole spectrum, not just the healthcare pieces, but social services, jail, justice, all of those things. Because you don't have to do it in a mm -hmm. picky picky. You can yeah. do it the other way and see how much we're really spending. Because let's spend it better. And the second one is, what do the mothers themselves actually say? could make a difference. Yeah, thank you. So on the first question, I'm not aware of um, a major analysis, and, and Dan might actually want to comment from his Center for Evidence and Drug Policy. Certainly there's been some work that I think you've been doing on costing, like, or describing the current state and how much criminalization kind of costs us. 
um, not necessarily for women and, and this issue, but generally. So maybe I'll let Dan speak to that after. Uh, I'm not aware of that, but I, I do know there was a major sort of policy response to this when Minister Philpott was Minister of Health, mm -hmm. and we had um, um, Carolyn Bennett as Minister of Indigenous Services, and there was a, a some meetings that I went to and others around reforming child welfare. Certainly she's made a number of responses and really acknowledged the Canada's role in this, um, particularly for Indigenous children. And so I think that's sort of starting to work its way through the system. Um, and the Toronto piece, I, I read the Globe and Mail piece that probably you read as well. They're doing some big, some innovative pilots as well. But I, I would say we, we still have a ways to go to, to actually change the system. Um, so if there's researchers in the room, I think this is definitely a, a space for collaboration and we absolutely invite you to get in touch. Uh, on the second question, um, what are mothers say? I think, I mean, mothers say uh, in qualitative work, but also in a clinical practice, like give us the things we need, like give us uh, diapers and clothes and um, give us safe places to sleep and give us respect and you know treat us like other mothers and don't don't judge us um, probably housing is, is one of the number one things women say they need and want and and to not just be stuck in this sort of cycle of you know short-term um, housing issues and then food security I think that's kind of often the biggest thing people need um, and whether that's if they need um, infant replacement another big area that I think is under spoken about is just when you grow up in the foster care system and you don't have a network of grandparents and a network of aunties and uncles, like how do you build that community? So myself as a young drug using mother was really beneficial, partly like my current husband. We're still, still together 20 years later and we have a 10 year old, but his family was really stable and they were very much our support network and we could still go out on the weekends with our friends and have our, ch our son with grandparents, which is a safe place. A lot of my clients don't have that. So like, they just want to do what anybody wants to do. You want to go out and have a date night with your husband and go on a, or your wife or whatever, and you want to go and have some wine, like you have someone you can call to do that, or you have the money to pay a babysitter. These women don't have that. And that's when sort of we have instances where, you know, people get called, it's like, oh, they left the baby, like, well, you know, just any young parent needs some backup. I mean, anyone who has children can kind of relate to that. So how do we build those backups? So it's Shiwei, part, part of the work is fostering babysitting networks within. We actually have a child care center, an emergency daycare on the third floor um, that people can come last minute because we all know daycare wait lists are huge. So if you don't have a Shiwei, how, how can you build those backups organically in a, in a community advocacy role here? How can you make sure that women have even thought about that and talked about, you know, facilitating dialogue in prenatal classes about that is one strategy we've used in the rural communities. Dan, do you want to comment yeah, on? Yeah, so just very different than organic. Mm -hmm. On the issue of institutionalization, there's incredible cost effectiveness evidence that institutionalization of people who are using substances or um, you know, in the, that are institutionalized because of substance use, always less cost effectiveness than other non-institutionalization options. I think the, the really good question that your work raises is that if we want to do a cost effectiveness analysis of the institutionalization of children, we really have to take into account the impact of child loss on the mother mm -hmm. and the mother's use of services after that, mm -hmm. right? So what is the cost of uh, non-fatal or even a fatal overdose yeah. on the system? And, and I think that's where your, your work is super novel and can open up a whole new area of like truly quantifying mm -hmm. the cost of that for this year. Yeah. And yeah, on the side of the, the uh, child's, the, the cost of child institutionalization is going to be astronomical, but if you also take into account the potential preventive Mm -hmm. impacts on the mother's trajectory through, um, you know, her life, I think it, it just, it's an order of magnitude higher, so it's really exciting. Thank you. A lot of work to be done. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so Maybe. much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.